So yesterday for lunch, my wife and I, Jesus Taylor. <laughs> Sorry for the YouTube side. We just spent 15 minutes on Patreon not talking baseball. And then and wrap right it up away, with, as soon as he we wrap Adam it up with like, OK, in. we should probably talk baseball. Let's get to baseball. OK, count us in three, two, one. Let's roll. So I'm out at lunch the other day. Yes. OK, there we go. Okay. Start with the story. Reel <laughs> them in with with stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the Blue Jays. But let me tell you, this lunch that I went for, it all comes around to a Blue right. Jays story. All right. I'll pipe down. Show a little I'll patience here. Yes, sir. Adam just put up with 15 minutes of me yammering on Patreon. And he's like, okay, well, now let's get serious. And then that's, this is how we started. So, uh, again, hello and welcome to the walk-off, everybody. Uh, we're meandering and off-topic before the show has even started. This has got to be a new record. Uh, I'm Scott Belford, joined by the best co-host in the biz, Adam Mack. So yesterday, Taylor and I go for lunch at Tarazzi's, which is this little Italian place, literally half a block from my house. Hey. The lady who serves us, we start talking, and it turns out she's a big Blue Jays fan. And then the podcast comes up, and then she starts talking about her husband. And she's like, my husband actually just about caught Aaron Judge's tying home run baseball. Nice. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah. My husband, Frank. And I was like, Frank Lasagna guy? I'm like, your husband's Frankie Lasagna? She's like, yeah. She literally brings out this binder of like, obviously the craziness that went down News with the media and, and stuff yeah, yeah. after he dropped that ball and, and watched $1.5 million slip out of his fingers there. But it was really funny. They've got like the increase in their website numbers. Mm -hmm. So they're like, this is before he did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then this is after like 8,000 clicks on their website in one day compared to like 26 normally. It was just really funny. funny. And like him on Tim and Sid and, or I guess it was Sid breakfast television there or whatever. But right. yeah, so I got to meet. Frankie Lasagna's wife. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Like, what a small world. Yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. Anyways, cool. there we go. That's that's your intro, folks. We are going to actually talk some baseball here. Lots to get to. The Philly series. That was going to be Bowden Francis's real test. And, uh, well, we'll get into it. Work from Dome. Listen, this promotion... I, I'm going to just say I hate this promotion. Number one, the Blue Jays, I think they're 0-6 during work from Dome games. Also, work from Dome just, boy, it rubs yeah. me the wrong way. We'll we'll get into that. Okay. Addison Barger continues to improve at the plate. Had a really rough stretch when he first came up, but he's looking like a keeper right now. Matt Chapman signs a huge extension with the San Francisco Giants, making Scott Boris look like a genius and him turning down a hundred plus million from the Jays, like the right move. Who would have seen that coming out of the 31 year old third baseman? Whit Merrifield got plunked in the head the other day and had some strong words to say about it. Of course, Wit picked up by the Atlanta Braves. The Jays headed to Atlanta, so that kind of fits in really well with all of our topics, which we are going to end off on previewing this Blue Jays-Braves series. On that, let's get into it. But first, Pierre but first, Paulian, My wife and I were going for supper sick. the other day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, two-game series against the Phillies. Yep. The Blue Jays drop them both. Um, honestly, man, it was kind of a tough series to watch. It really felt like this is a series the Jays could have could have won. Mm -hmm. Up six nothing in game one, wound up losing that ten nine. Bullpen implodes, and then pitcher of the month in August, Bowden Francis, on Wednesday. The work from Dome Day afternoon game. So the wife and I got cheap tickets and went to the went to the game on Wednesday. Excited to see Bowden Francis and how he performed. And it's funny because 
Midway through the third, I get a text from a buddy of mine who watches the podcast. And he just is like, oh boy, this is a Mentos in the Coke can backyard kind of thing. Which if you watched our our Tuesday episode, The Mailbag, obviously you had a... You built on my my Mentos in a Coke metaphor, and you were just kind of, we were talking about how the Mentos yes. is like the splitter. Yes. The Coke is Bowden Francis's repertoire, and just when you put that splitter in there, oh, it just gave it some extra juice. And then you said, yes, right? You're, you're dropping Mentos in your house. It's causing a mess. It's causing a mess everywhere. You, but then you go out in the backyard because it's fun now, and, and, and now you can have fun with it. And that the idea of that was... Will not, yeah. will hitters, well, hitters readjust? And they did. And they did. At least in the first inning, anyways. And listen, I don't think we, as Blue Jays fans, should and can expect Bowden Francis to just allow two hits every four games. So it did catch up to him a little. And, and listen, when you lose a 3-2 a game, it's tough to sit around and point fingers at the starting pitcher, even though he only went five innings. You know what? He put up a start that they could have won with, mm -hmm. and it is too bad. So drop in the comments here where you think Bowden Francis lands in the long term. Are we just witnessing a real hot streak here? Is he more along the lines of what we saw on Wednesday? You know, kind of that four ERA guy, four to five guy. And listen, if that's what Francis is, I think that's a win. Like, Adam, do you think going into 2025, if if, if Francis can be a guy who gives us five to six innings as that fifth starter with a round of 4.25 ERA, yeah, are, are you happy course. with that? I'd be, I'd be thrilled with that. Yeah. Like four, two ERA on your fifth starter. That's, uh, I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't really yeah. have anything else to add on Bowden Francis. I was pleasantly satisfied with his outing against the Phillies. He did go six innings. So it was three, three earned runs over six. It was, I think, three earned runs in the first inning and then settled in nicely. But mm -hmm. again, this kind of goes to what I was saying on Tuesday is that he doesn't have to worry about getting a quick hook. Like, I think if this game happens in April, I don't think he gets to the sixth inning. Yeah. I think he he gives up two home runs in the first and goes, oh, fuck. And everybody's looking at the bullpen saying, okay, who do we got? Because this game's getting away from us real quick. Like, here we go again with Bob and Francis. That's that's what I think. And I think that's well, I definitely think not the case because I think the, t the pep talk is he comes back to the dugout after the first inning and Schneider goes, hey, I need 85 more pitches out of you. So get past it, buddy. And it worked because he settled yeah. right in. Listen, I think this is a really good point to bring up, Adam, is that in the past, being roughed up in the first inning, it would have spelled the end of Bowden Francis's start. And he came back in the second, he shut them down, and he provided them with six innings. So, yeah, giving up three runs in that first isn't great, but... Man, I've been impressed with Francis. I mean, how can you not? August pitcher of the month, obviously. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm really curious how things play out going into 2025 and if Francis can be a, a legit start starting pitcher here. In, in the vein of toxic positivity, I will say this, because I've been poo-pooing that I don't think he can be a 4-2 ERA guy next season when the games actually matter. Mm -hmm. I will say, if there is a way that the mental performance department can talk to him all off season and just be like, hey, same thing next year. Like, if you get blown up in the first, yeah. move past it. It worked great for you after the All-Star break last year. Just go into every game with that same mindset, even if it's not true. Right. But then I also hope maybe Schneider and the rest of the coaching staff can recognize that, like, hey, if we just 
make him feel safe. He'll settle in, even if it's a rough start, rough first inning. But if he feels like we've got his back, he'll settle in because he did it 11 times the last half of, of, of last year. Maybe maybe that's the path to him actually being a, a 4.2 fifth starter. I don't know if it'll happen, but that's me being toxically positive. The Philadelphia Phillies are also a very, very potent offense. That was mm-hmm. a definite test. For Francis, Agreed. I would say he passed. I would say he passed. Yeah, for a fifth starter, that's a pass for sure. Like if your fifth starter gives you a Six chance, innings, three runs against uh, a against top offense, yeah, top you'll be teams. thrilled. Hundred yeah. percent. Where are you, the grounds crew on Bowden Francis? Drop your comments. We'll get to them for mailbag on Tuesday. So it was a work from dome day which has not been a very impressive record from the Blue Jays. I think they're 0-6 on work from dome days. I don't know why it rubs me the wrong way so much. Just the phrasing of it. You know, like there's kids' days. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of places will call the mid-afternoon days. There's dog days. A lot of parks like to have their bark at the park in the afternoon. But nothing feels more corporate and more Rogers than, hey, work from dome. You can work and watch baseball and work. (laughs) I mean, okay. Yeah, I I don't know if this is exactly where you're going with this, but... There is a connotation there that, like, baseball isn't a captivating sport, and we're acknowledging that. Yes. Right? It is a background noise while you do other stuff kind of sport. Especially, like, regular season baseball, early to mid-season baseball, and when your baseball team sucks, baseball. It is definitely, uh, I'm doing laundry, and the Jays game is on while I'm folding, kind of a day. Um, So, like... It is just a weird, like, there's no edge of your seat day, right? <laughs> like, yes. Um, <laughs> there is leave your phones at home day. You don't want to miss a thing kind of a th- like. So it is weird, but it is also like the only way I watch non-playoff baseball is with a heavy multitask going on. Yeah. And when I say playoff baseball, I will include like the playoff push in September and even sometimes late August. Like when we're jockeying for position or fighting out for a wild card spot. That for me, maybe that's because growing up with the Jays sucking for so long, it's like that's all I've ever had really is like, oh, like maybe we can have meaningful baseball in September. That's a playoff run for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but outside of that, to just tune into a game on a, Wednesday in June, it's not getting my undivided attention. No. So work from home. I, mean, I get it, honest, but it is also kind honest, of weird to acknowledge that. It is easy to tune out sometimes, even in the middle of the most exciting games. There are just, it's part of the law. Lo- like it's part of what I love about baseball too, is that there are those bursts of like extreme athleticism, these bursts of extremely exciting baseball and then there are downtime moments where yeah if you want to take a few minutes to go to the fridge and grab another beer or you got to roll up a j whatever it is right there's time to do it (laughs) what about this for a promotion netflix and chill day at the dome we're gonna just play an entire lord of the rings movie from start to finish director's (laughs) cut from first inning on the jumbotron it's just on the jumbotron all game long we're not doing like stadium pa we're not announcing batters or the new pitcher or defensive substitutions you're getting audio of the lord of the rings and we're gonna see if the jays can finish a game before the lord of the rings is done and if they do everyone gets chicken nuggets or something (laughs) but like come on watch a movie while you watch a game it's so easy because there's so much downtime 
What do you think? I think that's great. Could, Lord of the Rings is the perfect the perfect one too, because while they're while they're walking for twenty five minutes, you can watch the game. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, work uh, from dome. I just, I honestly, it just, I know that I listen. It's a pun. It's yep. a middle of the afternoon Wednesday game. How else are you going to promo it? Uh-huh. I think it's just I'm I'm bitter against this front office right now for the way this team is playing, and so I'm also going to blame them for the the promo of like, hey, come work while you watch baseball, get some about, business done. What about we have leftover Anthony Bass jersey giveaway day? Is that <laughs> All right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, moving on. Moving on. Work from dome. Yeah, I guess chime in if you want. Yeah. Is it is it a great promo that I'm just being a a fussy boy about? You know, it it does also like feel like a greedy corporate boy of like, yes. get your work done while you're doing the like emphasis on the work. Yeah. Don't forget to be productive to society. I don't know. All right. We've probably spent more than enough time on work from Dome. Yeah, and and we'll touch on Addison Barger here really quick before we move on here to the Matt Chapman extension. I know that uh, his numbers are... I mean, really, for lack of a better way of putting it, been really good. He's got his average up above 200 now. I think it's pushing 210, which I listen. And I know Adam just <laughs> made a little smart ass smirk there, but it's yeah. because he, he started so badly. Like he was literally the first time he got called up. By the time he got sent back down to AAA, he was hitting around 140. So you know what? It is one of those difficult things when you're a hitter to dig yourself a hole. And then you got to stare up at that jumbotron and look at that batting average every game. And it's starting to get so it's more palatable for him to look up at that batting average. He's changed his stance drastically. Uh, I know this was Chris Black who noticed this down to Black on Twitter. But if you look at his stance, his feet are about double in distance apart compared to where he was at when he was struggling early in the season. Like it was a big enough of a change where I was like, wow, you don't really see guys make that drastic of a change to the, especially their lower half guys tend to like, they're always tweaking their arms and stuff like that, but watching him make such a drastic change and then it work out. You love to see it by and chance. It's... Do you, do you have his numbers up? Yeah. Um, so post All Star break, I don't know exactly when he got sent down to AAA. It looks like he was with the Jays until July fifth. Yeah. Um, but from Ju- July twenty fifth until today, he's got a two forty five batting average, but a five forty one slugging and a mm-hmm. eight twenty seven OPS. Yeah, he's hitting dingers now. Uh, seven it. home runs in thirty games. Yeah. So that is a. 38 home run pace on 162, which uh, yeah. average batting average for the league this year is 238, by the way. So he has been hitting above the average and his slugging is incredible since he's been called up because he's hitting dingers. That's the thing, right? You hit homers. You're going to watch that OPS go up. You're going to watch that slugging percentage go up. And this is the kind of profile that this team needs they need a guy who's going to hit some home runs Addy plays third he plays right he can move around the diamond a little bit he might even I, um, have the edge right now on some of these other guys uh these, uh, these other lefties that he's going to be fighting for a spot with uh one thing that stood out to me too um was his arm strength it's pretty good throwing the ball there was a play this week i think I don't know who it was went into foul territory to catch a ball in the play I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I don't remember who it was now. So like into the netting catches the ball over the wall there at uh, right, right. Field oh, Leo line. Jimenez when he ran right in, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
base runner on third tag to score and Addison Barger got the ball from Jimenez and threw an absolute missile to home and got him. Yeah. I was like, that throw from like uh unordinary location, mm-hmm. you know, like, the, and just to fucking go for it, it was good. It was a good throw. So I don't know. That, that stood out to me a little too. bit. That whole sequence was incredible because yep. Leo just, I mean, full out laid himself out. Uh-huh. To make that catch, a catch that nobody thought was going to happen. Ernie Clement's reaction was beautiful because Ernie Clement's reaction was his hands on his head, and you could just hear see his mouth going, "Oh my God, are you okay?" Oh. Well, Barger's like, "Ball, ball, give me the ball." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's good, hey. right? So, and then and they turned the double play, man. It was saved a run. Yeah, it was a uh, impressive little play to say the least. Um, Addison Barger, in addition to his uh, home run numbers, also putting up good doubles, uh, mm-hmm. eight doubles in the 30 games since the All-Star break, which is – it's a – how do I say this? Vladdy has 40 doubles on the season over 138 games. Mm-hmm. Dalton Varsho's second on the team with 21 over 130 wow. games. So if you just prorated eight doubles in every the 30, 30 games. games since the all-star break, it works out to 35 doubles. So to give you an idea, like Vladdy having a great offensive year and Barger would be second on the team. If I know that's not how it works. You can't actually just extrapolate no, like that. For but sure. Just to okay. give you an idea of how, how much his bat is is producing right now? It is actually listen. Good. This team has lacked home runs and doubles all year. The numbers show that. Like after what you just said, too, right? Like mm-hmm. if 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 Var Show is number two on this team with twenty one, and Vladdy's leading with double that, right? There's yeah. a, there's a lack of production in this lineup when it comes to hitting doubles and hitting dingers, and that's why the team OPS is where it's at. And I think that Addison Barger, again, his profile really does stand out as something that could be very valuable to this team in 2025. And of course, there's a bunch of lefty bats vying for spots. We've talked about this with Wagner and La Profito and and Horowitz. And I mean, literally, it feels like almost every guy vying for a spot next year is a lefty bat. So having a guy who's going to hit dingers, hit home uh, doubles and with the versatility that Barger has, maybe he winds up being the guy who wins a spot on that 2025 uh, man roster. Um, Season totals, again, just extrapolating that number, small sample size into a big size. I know it's not fair, but just it's, I always find it interesting to frame it like that. Uh, It would be a 43 doubles on the season. If he was to do this over 162 games. Um, that's a lot. I know Vladdy's at 40 already, but last year, Matt Chapman led the Blue Jays with 39 doubles. Right. Um, Bichette had 30, Vladdy had 30. Uh, season before in 2022, when we still had Teoscar and Guriel, uh, Guriel had 32, Teoscar had 35, Vlad had 35, and Bo Bichette, who led baseball and hits that year, had 43 doubles. Wow. So that's, uh, that's impressive. One year back, uh, if we take Marcus Simeon, when he was here slugging the ball, 39 doubles uh, led the Blue Jays that year. So, yeah, 40 doubles is a big number. And that's the pace he's on for how he's hitting since the All-Star break. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. He, he, his bat is absolutely heating up. The home runs are there. Doubles are there. Addison Barger, if he's our shortstop next season, how do you feel about that? Well, I don't think I want to see him at short, but nope. – uh... I mean, where do you, where do you is, play it? It is. It's funny because Barger, it is his natural position is short. And that's a really interesting thing to bring up because if Bo is wound up gone, gone you know, yeah. and these are the rumors and who fucking knows. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can speculate on why, what Bo Bichette's future is until we're blue in the face. And we kind of already have, but that is an interesting thought that Addison Barger is a natural shortstop. Does he slot in there? 
if Bo's gone. Is his glove any worse than Bo's if he's gone? I, I don't know. I, I per- personally, I like seeing him at third and in right. He's got that cannon of an arm. Yeah. These are the wrinkles that make it an interesting speculation, like the idea of moving Vlad to third. And it's like, well, defensively, he's not sound. You're coming for Matt Chapman. And Matt Chapman, you know, platinum glove winner and all this stuff. But then when you look at Addison Barger going to shortstop, you go, uh, well, yeah, Bo wasn't exactly winning any gold gloves for us. Um, Before we totally move on from this, I just wanted to say we talked about Ross Atkins needing to save his job next year or this offseason. Yeah. I was thinking about it since then. I don't think Bo's gone, if that's the case. Like, I don't think... If Ross Atkins is on a, this is my last shot. If I don't do something here, I might be done in baseball. Yeah. Or probably done as a GM in baseball. So what is the benefit to him? Even if you got an absolute haul for Boba Shett. Like if we just absolutely, every sports journalist, every expert was in unanimous decision that we heisted the Dodgers for Boba Shett. What they gave up, six of their top 10 prospects. Something absurd. Yeah. Does that move the radar, move the gauge at all on Ross Atkins' job security for the following season? Like, I think it's only... Total wins and playoff performance is the only thing that can save Ross Atkins' job. I don't think I don't think we go, well, we missed the playoffs again and won 75 games, but man, did we ever restock the cupboards for 2027? Good job, Ross. Here's another only, kick at the cat. I think I and and by the way, um, I know we had a few but listen, there's more than one way to skin a can. Thank you. All Hold I'm on. saying is that there are people out there who brought up you kicking the cat down the road. Just need to clarify. Obviously, we're well aware of the actual saying. It was a Freudian slip years ago, and we keep going to that callback. Well, we can't help it as comics. We found it it's, hilarious. It's the Gary Gossman in us. It's the Gary Gossman in us. We can't help ourselves. Uh, no, I, I agree with what you're saying, dude. I will say that if... He does wind up moving Bo. I think the only real reason he would do so is if he is getting pieces back that he feels he's plugging in and are helping this team in 2025 move forward. So if maybe Bo Bichette brings back a couple prospects and a number two pitcher in your rotation, maybe that's something that is okay, sure. a, a viable. Maybe. I, but but I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Like, especially if, Bo's value on the open market is as low as some people are speculating. Yeah. So if you are truly selling at his lowest point, then it's almost silly to move him right now when at the worst case scenario at the trade deadline, you can move him and get the, the same, same amount thing. back. Hopefully he's recouped some value and you can move because him for the same amount. He does have to... Like, it is a contract year next year for him. Mm-hmm. This is going to be the most recent stat line on his yes. resume heading into all of those contract deals with, like, negotiations with everyone. So for a guy that's bet on himself and just the kind of person that I know him personally to be from all the years I've spent with him, um, he... He, I just expect him to have a monster season next yeah. year. Like whether he's miserable with the Jays or not, and like if that was a factor, I don't want to speculate on. Oh, the Jays suck, so why would he even try? Like, okay, let's just say worst case scenario, that is the attitude he had this year. I don't think that's the case, but if that was the case, he has to get a pep talk from dad and agent and mom and whoever else, wife, friends, be like, dude just fucking suck it up you've got to go out there and hit 45 doubles and 200 hits and 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 31 home runs this year because that's the difference like if he would have had a monster season this year given his track record and this is the only bad season of his career Mm -hmm. right five really good seasons if not great seasons 
one blip that it pretty easy to excuse his injury, especially if next year is elite. Like if he put up like MVP votes kind of a season, right? Not like MVP season, but he's like, you know, top 10 MVP finishing or whatever, right? Like he's getting some consideration for hitting, you know, 315 with 30 home runs and blah, blah, blah. 43 right? like, doubles. From shortstop, how does he not? Yeah, 43 yeah. doubles. That That's where you start to go, okay, yeah, maybe someone gives him 300 million. But if he has another bummer of a season, maybe the Matt Chapman deal is what he gets. Yeah. You know? So, like, and... there, I just mean the range of outcomes contract-wise next offseason, not this offseason, yeah. next offseason, is so dependent on how his 2025 campaign goes, he has to be motivated regardless of, oh, the team's dog shit. We're not making the playoffs. He has to be self-aware and enough to be selfish for one season and be like, I'm just going to fucking ball out and you guys can fuck right off. Yeah. But I'm going to go make a trillion dollars uh, somewhere else and see ya. Like, so if I'm Ross Atkins, that's a consideration too, is like, I would bet on Bobachet this year, this like for next season. If I'm Ross Atkins and my job and my future in baseball depends on it, I'm going. I like what I saw out of Laddie at the end of last season. Hopefully that continues. Uh, I'm all in on Bowden Francis being our ace for next year. Um, <laughs> and Bobachet is going to work his absolute face off to be the most productive he's ever been in his career. I think that's a reasonable yeah. bet. And then you put pieces around that. Like, I think we're going to be buyers this off season and I think it's going to be frustrating to see. And I don't think we're going to have a particularly good season next year. I think we are going to be disappointed again, but I just don't see trading Boba Shett as being a move that extends Ross Atkins, Ross Atkins hot situation. Yeah. So. Yeah. Tough not to agree with that. And I know it was brought up a few times in this talk, but Matt Chapman, with a brand new shiny deal as of yesterday. Uh, Scotty Boris with Boris Corp gets it done for Chapman. I know that over the off season, there was a lot of talk about his low value and what Chapman was going to do. I mean, I know at the end of the 2024 or uh, 2024 at the end of the 2022 season, Matt Chapman looked like he was in line for, Maybe a $200 million deal. And then after 2023, everyone was shocked at how much uh, organizations around baseball were not prepared to give him term. The Giants kind of stepped in last minute and signed him to a one-year deal with an opt-out and or a two-year deal with an opt-out. And here we are. Matt Chapman with a bounce-back season, 31 years old, signs a six-year Hundred and fifty-one million dollar deal, beating the George Springer deal by a million bucks. Same age. So my question to you, Adam, is: Is there a scenario where signing a thirty-one-year-old to a six-year deal like this is the right move? Like, I I, I understand if they win a World Series, obviously. It is. And for those of you who are just blown away that Matt Chapman got this much money, he did have a huge bounce back year. He's sitting at six war right now. His wins above replacement look really, really good. He is still one of the best defensive third baseman in baseball. He has been healthy all year. So he's played 137 games. He has 514 at bats, 127 hits. He's got power again. He's hitting 22 dingers this year, probably finished with around 25 batting average in that 250 range so it is above average his ops looks good i just after last year and i think a lot of jays fans are kind of in this same boat i'm a little bit gobsmacked by the amount of term they wound up getting and i mean we're not there with the giants right like we're mm -hmm. not in that coaching staff we're not privy to the analytics department within san francisco May, they obviously saw something. They obviously liked Chappie and wanted him to be a member of this core for years going forward. But yeah, I'll throw to you here, Adam. Like, is 
Would have you been all right seeing something like this from the Jays for Chapman last year? But the Jays situation is different, though, because there is still like, ah, oh, that's money that we might not be able to give Bo Bichette now or Vlad or whatever, right? Like, when we signed Springer, it was kind of all money that was going to be spent before Bo and Vlad got paid, so it was it was fine. So that's a tough lens for me to say, oh, yeah, I'd be good with this as a Jays as a Jays organization. Um, I would say Matt Chapman for the Giants is the money going to be something that they hate in year five and six, the way we feel about George Springer's money right now. Yeah. I, I don't think infielders defensively decline the same way outfielders do um the mobility factor i think tapers off more than the reflexes factor right and i think a lot of like what playing the hot corner is all about is getting a good read on the ball and having that like lightning quick reaction it's not about you know whereas like aaron judge out in the outfield has got to you know run 45 steps to track down yeah. a fly ball right yeah um, and then also, I think it also doesn't taper off the same way offensive skills do. So, like, if I had to look, here's my comparison, and I'm going to throw this back at you. Looking ahead five seasons from now, and I'm not going to say who regrets their contract more, but who is regardless of how the next four years go just in year five what's a more frustrating contract for a fan base Aaron Judge or Matt Chapman because I feel like Aaron Judge as an outfielder and as a offensive like that's where most of his value comes from is being an offensive stud you give me five extra years on him his numbers come down the way Matt Chapman isn't getting paid to be a 60 home run guy. Yeah. So like if Matt Chapman is winning gold gloves at third base and hitting 238 with 15 to 20 home runs, I think you go, yeah, that's what we paid him for. That's what he I, gave us in 2024. And that's what he gave us in 2029. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know if the decline is there for a guy that is that kind of player. Although maybe his hitting does go from like, league average to like hole he's a fucking black hole offensively like he's hitting nine and it is a write-off it is an auto out maybe maybe it's that case i do like, constantly find myself wondering what happened last year you know like 31 years old for him to have that sort of season last year at 30 years old uh such a huge decline in his career numbers to watch him just rebound as a Jays fan, it's incredibly frustrating, right? Like mm -hmm. one of the reasons that this team didn't succeed like they were expected to in 2023 was because of Matt Chapman's decline. So if you watch a player regress like like Chappie did, I was pretty convinced. I, I was not convinced he was washed. I just figured that we wouldn't see a rebound like we've seen out of him this year. I, I truly didn't. You know, like six wins above replacement, that's nothing to sneeze at. That is an elite yeah. war in this league. I didn't expect his durability to bounce back like it has and him play every single game. And there is some real value in being able to pencil a name into a position without even thinking about it. I didn't expect him to have a batting average above the league norm. Mm -hmm. I didn't think his power would rebound like it has. So completely missed the, the mark on 
what I projected Matt Chapman to be this year, which is obviously well, I'm why I'm not working in a front office anywhere. Mm-hmm. But it just seems like so much term to give to a guy who like what happens, Adam, if next year he has 2023 again? And it would be really hard as a front office to not have that in your head all the time, right? Of like, Mm -hmm. what if one of these good years we're hoping he has? What if like, you know, because Mm -hmm. from 31 to 34, you hope that's where you're getting your production out of him, right? You're really Mm -hmm. hoping that the season Matt Chapman is having right now in 2024 is, is duplicated for 2025, six and seven. Mm -hmm. And then from there, obviously you're going to expect a decline at 35, but what if next year he's just an offensive black hole again? I'm not saying he's going to, but this is why I would be trepidatious about this contract. That's the difference between 150 and 200 million right there. I guess so. Right. And we've talked about that with George Springer, right? Is that if you're, you need to pay three hundred million dollars to get a, a sure thing. Otherwise, you get a good player for one hundred and fifty, and yeah, you might get a a Matt Chapman twenty twenty three. Yep. Before we move on, yeah. If Matt Chapman's getting six years, one hundred and fifty one million, bare minimum for Vladdy's twelve, three twenty. Right, like just double it term and years and money (laughs) yeah i don't know i'm gonna be interested to see how it goes yeah me too this vladdy this vladdy contract is honestly one of the more intriguing things that we're gonna watch play out in the off season if the rumors are true that the jays are trying as hard as it all the all the pundits are saying which is that they're very focused on signing vladdy this off season um, how much do you think Juan Soto goes for this off season? See, and this is the thing. If Juan Soto winds up getting what some people are projecting, which is 12 to 15 years, 600 million. Mm-hmm. How does Vladdy sign for anything under four? I, I know that technically mm-hmm. Juan Soto's positioning in right field is more valuable than first base, but Juan Soto is not a good right fielder. So I don't know, man. Like, is Juan Soto going to be a Shohei Otani unicorn and his price tag isn't going to affect the rest of the market? Or is Juan Soto close enough to what Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is that it will affect Vladdy's price tag if he gets some astronomical number that starts with a five or a six? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's interesting how that'll play out. Um, I think Juan Soto having another really good year here. OPS with one dot oh one five, uh, OPS plus one eighty three. Vladdy has a one seventy OPS plus right now, mm-hmm. OPS of nine sixty three. Like it is not. Here's the scenario that I think gets Vlad the most money. Well, it's obvious, right? But it's Juan Soto gets 600 million for regardless however many years this off season. And then next season, Vlad puts up better offensive numbers than he does. Yeah. That's not out of the realm of possibility. Like if Juan Soto has any kind of a regression, right? Right now, Like, even if he d- does what he did last year in San Diego, he hit 275 with 35 home runs and an OPS plus of 155. You tell me Vlad can't do that again? Yeah. Hit 35 home runs with an OPS of one se- OPS plus of 170 ish again? Like, yeah. even if he just. I mean, it's just right now he can't. I'm not saying it's like the likely outcome necessarily, but like we have to acknowledge that that's in the on the wheel that we're spinning of possible outcomes. And then I just think if that happens, that's a tough negotiation stance for Vlad to go into. Be like, fucking Juan just got six hundred million, and I hit better than he did this year. We're basically the same age. 
Yeah. Or any, I think Vlad's two years old or one year it, old or whatever. The more but. you talk about Juan Soto, the more I start to be like, maybe Vlad just, there's nothing you can do to extend him right now. Like if I'm Vladimir Guerrero Jr., the smartest thing I can do is play out my contract. Like play out the last year of my control with the Jays and go to the open market. Um, And who knows? We don't uh, know the value. Uh, the value might be a lot closer to Juan Soto gets 12 years, 400 million. Maybe there isn't a $600 million paycheck out there for him. I sorry. I got to correct myself. I thought I know Vladdy's young, but I just have it in my mind that Juan Soto is like stupid young. Yeah, no, he's 20. Vlad's, Vlad's yeah, younger Vlad's than younger. Juan Soto. Yeah. They're both uh, 25, but Juan Soto is an October 25th, 1998, and Vladdy is March 16th, 1999. So about uh, 150 days younger. So, there you go. yeah, I mean, like that's, that's a, yeah, you know, it's crazy. But I mean, 300 million is still life changing money. Like, and, that's a that's a tough gamble if you're Vlad to be like ah, three hundred maybe I could go for four but like also if I regress maybe I only get two twenty five right maybe I get hurt and I'm on a year one year deal trying to roll it back over again and maybe I never recap like there is reason to still sign a fucking mega deal like three hundred million is still yeah still a lot of absurd money. money. And so, again, I know Juan Soto is a lefty bat, but maybe he does only get four hundred million, which is such a hilarious thing to say. Only, only four hundred yeah. million. But if he gets four hundred million, maybe the Jays. And this is this is going to be interesting too, because I think that Juan Soto has to sign first before Vladi even considers signing an extension. Mm-hmm. But. I, I really do think that there is going to be a lot of parallels between Soto and Vlad when it comes to what what they sign for. So if mm-hmm. if Soto winds up with a 12-year, $400 million contract, maybe the Jays can get Vladdy for 350, 12 mil, or 12 years, I should say. I, I would also say, as far as a if we're just making a pros and cons list or a bullet point of does Bo get moved this off season. Now that you said like Vlad can't sign an extension until Juan signs his deal. I don't think the blue Jays can trade Bo Bichette until Vlad signs. Yeah. Cause that's just giving him so much extra leverage for like, yeah. Hey, what are you guys going to fucking do? You just got rid of Bo. Yeah, you just spent all this money renovating the stadium. You want to go fucking strutting Dalton Varsho and Addison Barger out on your Crustables commercials? Like honestly, that's a lot of fucking power. Yeah, before you sign Vlad. So I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I can, Yeah, I don't think Bo's gone next year. The more I think about it, and I've done a total one eighty in five days. Yeah, I thought I, there was I, no way he was a Blue Jay next year, and the more I think about it, the more I'm going. Yeah, he's, he's going to be a Blue Jay next year, and then he's gone. And we're going to get fucking a second-round draft pick for it. God, I hate that. All right, yep. let's move on. We're getting long in the tooth, so we'll wrap up here. Uh, before we talk Atlanta and the Blue Jay series, Whit Merrifield mm-hmm. was hit in the head two days ago. Um, he got removed from the game because of concussion protocol 95 mile an hour and they talked with him afterwards and if you haven't seen his press conference if i was you i would i would look it up he had some really interesting things to say about pitching in today's major leagues and basically his point was is that pitchers more and more are being Push to throw as fast as they can, max effort, velo constantly, whether or not they can locate. Mm-hmm. And basically his point was, is that a lot of guys are being pushed to throw up and inside, uh, don't truly have control over it, and guys are getting seriously hurt. And his point was, I could have lost my life. And he even said, he's like, listen, I'm not trying to be dramatic dramatic about this. Yes. But 95 miles to the head, he's like, 
when are we going to address this? Are we going to wait for someone to actually something horrible to happen? And then he also brought up pitchers. There's no repercussions anymore because pitchers don't hit. And you can't retaliate anymore. That's kind of an mm-hmm. aspect of the game that is kind of left. We every once in a while see the rules of the game enforced. And then a mm-hmm. major huge hub to do is is made about it. And a, guy, a bunch of guys are given suspensions. And then we probably don't hear about it for another year, right? Like mm-hmm. you're, you're good for like one a year unwritten yeah. rules type of punishment. Mm-hmm. But he makes a really good point that... Without that little bit of fear in the pitchers, there's no reason to not go up and in with a 95 mile an hour fastball and not care about what happens. Mm-hmm. What is it? What like you? You heard Wit talk. Yeah. What was your thoughts? Uh, well, things that stood out to me was that he is on the rules committee, and that yes. they're having a phone call. I think today. I don't know the timeline of when that. I think the clip was from yesterday so he says we're having a phone call tomorrow i mean today so and he said and it's going to be a long call like okay um but like we might hear something today probably won't but like wheels might get set in motion for rule change proposals this off season um and when i start thinking of it if we're you're not because you're not gonna be able to change the approach of teams, like he said, you know, you just bring up a kid from triple a who doesn't know how to locate, but he throws a hundred and you just yeah. go, okay, well just set up in the middle of the plate, you know, as the catcher and let's throw, throw as hard that. as you can. Right. Um, so like, you're not going to change that roster management approach. So how do you fix it? You're not going to legalize retaliating. You think no. that's, never coming back um so like the only option that i could think of is you get it more than one base for uh being batter right that like that's the incentive of like hey if you're gonna go out there and plunk a guy you're not just putting them on first you're putting them in scoring position that is actually a really interesting way to deal with this problem because the other thing that stood out to me about what wit was saying is that when a guy gets hit, let's say in the he's head, out, he's yeah, out. he's out next game. Want and this is what CT Major League scan? Baseball has done to make sure that there aren't concussion injuries and and long term problems that arise from this. Right? Is that mm-hmm. you, you got to protect go the player the from himself? Protocol. So there is no repercussions for the pitcher. They get to stay out there and keep pitching. You plunk a guy in the head, and he has to be taken out of the game, even if he in the end feels good, he's got to go through that 12 hours of concussion protocol Mm -hmm. because concussions are a strange animal. Mm -hmm. You might not look concussed right away and then be very concussed within a few hours. Well, was it Anthony Rizzo last year that had like lingering effects like a month later? He passed concussion protocol and then still played like three weeks with a concussion. They're like, we don't understand why he's so foggy and can't concentrate and striking out in weird ways. And then yeah. they're like, oh, he's been concussed this whole time, right? Like, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's that's the real consequence. Because like the the pitcher, I don't think even got ejected. No. Because it wasn't right. intentional. But that's right. the thing. It was careless. Which is just as bad. Who cares what the motive is? I'd rather, honestly, rather get intentionally plunked. Because most guys, I think, when they're doing it intentionally, like throw at your back or your ribs or your butt, your legs. Like they're not, you know, you don't get the middle finger signal from the catcher and then go, okay, 100 at the head. Let's do it. Yeah. You know, maybe a, a sociopath or two does that. But for the most part. You know, if it's just a revenge for whatever happened last game and you're getting them back, you know, you're just, you're not trying to end anyone's career. Whereas, yeah, like, I mean, that shots to the head, man. It's, it's bad. Like, oh, that, yeah, I, but really, I don't know what the right answer honestly, is. Honestly, Adam, it, I love that idea of like, you know what? Maybe a hits bats, maybe that is the solution to this is that when a guy gets plunked, maybe if it is the head, 
If he gets plunked, it's first base. If it's anything above the shoulders, he gets second. Yeah, I, I like because you'd have to figure out a way to to like enforce like as oh, any rule changes, right? Like you don't want to swing things so far that there's those there's always unforeseen consequences and exploits. Like we don't want to see the Rays sending nine guys out crowding the plate, just yeah. rattling off double after double of like, oh, two bean balls in a row and we're scoring a run. Like, yeah, you know, that's a trade hats, we'll make. The big yeah. hats that we the Rays There's, come out with big batting helmets like this, and you're like, ah oh, man, this yeah, is space super balls loose now. jerseys, yeah. <laughs> like just they're out there with their hammer pants on and just trying yeah. to catch any loose ball they get. Like because that's the thing, is it you know, when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, if you're going to make that rule and you say, okay, you hit some guy and it's a double instead of just putting them on first, it's like, is that enough to t tilt the scales of discouragement where you go, well, yeah, but we still want this 100 mile an hour, 20 year old, just giving his best. If he puts a guy on second every once in a while, eh, that's a yeah eatable cost for us in the equation, right? So maybe, maybe a double isn't enough, but then you go, is it? Do you put them on third? But then you go, that feels like that's exploitable, right? Like, because you definitely yeah. don't want a situation where guys are intentionally getting hit or whatever, right? Like, where it's just, like, less motivation to even get out of the way. Like, I know they have to, like, technically, like, make an attempt to get out of the way. But and in real speed, it's hard to evaluate. Did a guy lean into the ball? Was he, you know, winding up for the swing and it clipped him? And then to watch it on super slow mo is like as if you're going to get an accurate yeah. representation of what was happening in the moment in real time. So you can't replay review it. I don't think. I mean, you probably can, but I don't think that's a good idea. So I don't know, but yeah, maybe it's just still like if you hit a guy below the numbers, it's a single, and if you hit him in the head, it's a fucking it's a run. He just comes home. Yeah. Who knows. Like that, I, 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 please. But that's up for people smarter than me. To, and, yeah, and ground us crew to members out, right, would balance. love to hear your thoughts. Maybe there is a solution that we're just not seeing right now. So if you've got yeah. a solution, number one, would love to hear your thoughts on what Whit Merrifield said. This is definitely a subject we will tackle in the mailbag. Would love to hear your thoughts on what Whit Merrifield said. Would love to know if you can foresee any sort of solution to this problem, because. It's a sticky one. Like it's mm -hmm. a it's a tough one to solve. It's a real legitimate problem in the league right now and it's a tough problem to solve. We will end on the fact that the Blue Jays head to Truist Field tonight. They are playing the Atlanta Braves. Of course, there is that constant tie between the Blue Jays and the Braves because of Alex Anthopoulos who of course formerly general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. And we've watched it seems like Every player this this fan base loved, Kevin Pillar, Jose mm -hmm. Batista, Josh Donaldson, they all pretty much had their their run through with the Braves as well, which is kind of funny. That's funny. And the Braves are are not the juggernaut that they have been the last few years. They still have a very good record of 76 and 64. They're still hanging on to that final wild card spot, but they're not, they're not winning the division this year. They're not, I, I mean, guys like Matt Olson who hit 54 bombs last year is mm. having an incredibly down season when it comes to power. Kevin Gosman and Max Freed take the mound for the Jays and the Braves tonight. Game starts at 720 Eastern time. So a little bit. Yeah, I, I, Atlanta always, there's always those uh, teams where they start 20 minutes after, or there's the teams like Seattle where they start like 640. Mm -hmm. Major League Baseball tries to get those East Coast and West Coast teams, like the time's a little bit closer and it makes for some weird start times. So 720 is the start time. And then we're going to see tomorrow uh, taking the mound. Of course, I just pulled up Sunday, so give me a second here. Jose Barrios and Schwellenbach. Hmm, I like that name, Schwellenbach. <laughs> 
And then on Sunday, the pitching matchup looks like Yariel and Chris Sale. Chris Sale. Unreal. The renaissance he's having with the mm -hmm. Atlanta Braves. He's one of the favorites to win the Cy Young Award in the National League. He's got 206 strikeouts this year. So once again, his strikeouts are back. Chris Sale's always been a strikeout machine, but um, struggled staying on the field in Boston. But he's had a real comeback year, a whip of 1.01, 160 innings pitched. He's been healthy the whole time, an ERA of 2.46. So Sunday's game is going to be a tough one for the Blue Jays. Anything to add? Uh, long toss this Sunday. Yeah, both Adam and I are going to be doing long toss. I think this is the first one of the year where both you and I are on the panel. I'm going to be running it. Um, and Joel on, on the back of a brain Joel, series. He's yes. going to have some Joel and Jen passion. I know we've missed three weeks in a row now. I'm well aware that uh, the disappointment is palpable amongst you folks on the grounds crew. So apologies for that, but we are excited to have the, the old gang back together Sunday. That is going to be from six till eight Eastern after that, uh, one PM blue Jays Braves start. So yeah, join us for long toss live on YouTube, and then we'll see you Tuesday for the mailbag. Drop your comments and questions below. Cheers. Cheers.